the law of human collapse. And that means men keep messing up and messing up and messing up. And they mess up and God have you see this in your own life. You see don't don't you? You you do real good for a while, bam, you mess up. You cry out, Oh God help me, the Lord helps you. You do real good for a while, bam, mess up. That's the story of the book of Judges. The book of Judges teaches that everything falls apart if it's left alone. It's the, the law, it's, it's a total rebuke of the religion the world calls evolution. And the book of Judges teaches that unless there's an outside force intervening, everything goes apart. If you don't ever do nothing to your car, it'll be sitting on the side of the road somewhere. You have to mess with it. You have to put fuel in it. You have to put oil in it. You have to uh, put tires on it. You Nothing gets better with time unless there's an outside force. I don't have my watch on tonight. If you've got a watch, it'll run down. If you leave it alone, it'll run down. Then an outside force, a man's hand, comes and gets it, winds it up, and it does good for a while. Then it runs down. Everything in the world teaches us that evolution is the biggest lie the devil ever hatched out of hell. Nothing gets better with time. Everything gets worse. We, start, we didn't start out as a little amoeba and we're gradually getting better and better. We started out at the top and been going down ever since, since the Garden of Eden. So that's what the book of Judges teaches. They, they get in bondage, they get delivered. They get in bondage, they get delivered. They get in bondage, they get delivered. That's the book of Judges. It's just uh, one mess right after another. They cry to the Lord. And then they do real good for a while. Bam, he sells them into the hands of so-and-so. And they do cry unto the Lord. He delivers them. Bam. The book of Judges has 21 chapters. It has 618 verses. It has 18,976 inspired words. It is the most, um, one of the most amazing books in the Old Testament. It happened between the time of Joshua, right around the death of Joshua, before they started having kings. So there was a place there before God let Saul be the first king. There was a little interval there for a, a long time when the Bible said every man did that which was right in his own eyes. Anarchy. And that's what the book of Judges teaches. Every man. We're going to get into some of the strangest stories in the whole Bible. We done had that one on Judges 19 a few weeks ago when I preached on the strangest story in the Bible uh, where the man had to cut up his concubine into 12 pieces and mail her out to all the 12 tribes of Israel. Do uh, you believe that literally happened? Absolutely. Uh, Samson, who got a haircut in the wrong barber shop and it cost him his eyes. Uh, Gideon, who had won the wars with 300 soldiers. Uh, Sisera, the old guy that got, it, got nailed, a picture of the Antichrist. And, and uh, Jephthah, Jephthah and his awful vow that he made when he had sacrificed his daughter to the Lord. Those are some strange stuff went on because there was no leader, there was no king. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. Now, with that introduction tonight, we talked about last week about how the Lord uh, told them in the book of Joshua to go in there and chase some heathen out of that land. He said, go in there and possess the land. Now, let me tell you something, people. When I first started reading the Bible, I didn't understand this, uh, and maybe you don't, so it might help you. Have you, ever, uh, you, ever, you ever heard anybody say, man, God sure was mean. He told them to go in there and kill all them poor people. No, it's not exactly like that. There's a reason for it. Like, like uh, uh, I pick up this microphone stand and hit a dog with it or something. That's what God did, does. He takes nations and whips other nations when that nation forsakes him. I'd say a lot about our nation going to be punished, and we are. We're going to get it. This nation going to get it. Ain't no nation ever done what we're doing and got by with it. It's getting worse and worse and worse and worse and worse. And we're going to get it. We're going to get it. I just hope we're gone when it comes. But if, if not, this country going to get it. And uh, when they do, God will use a heathen country to give it to us. Now, God was using his people to run the heathen out. 
of the Jebusites, the Perizzites, the Amorites, the Skeeterbites, and all them people. And, uh, and the Lord, Lord was put, running them out of there, and uh, he, he run all them people out because they were in all kinds of immorality that we can't even talk about here in a, in a mixed congregation. Just filthy, ungodly, wicked sin, so much that the sexually transmitted diseases were in animals, people, and everything. I mean, it was a whole... And that's why the Lord said, you, you, can't, you can't spare them. Drive them out. Drive them out. Because you'll be worshiping their gods and, and you'll be following their customs. Get them out. Get them out. So, look here in Judges chapter 1 and we got over to about uh, verse number... Verse number... Uh, I think we got down to about verse uh, 11 last, last week and uh, we talked to about verse 10. Oh yeah, we got to 12. So we're in 13 tonight where that guy gave his daughter to that fellow to wife uh, as, as a prize. And we talked about male chauvinism and how sexism is, is, is ridiculous and how that they're trying to say now that, uh, that how horrible they did in the Bible. And I'm not, and I'm not saying that was right, uh, but it probably worked better than a lot of these choices they're making now. Amen. Uh, but anyway, anyway, and uh, verse number 14 is where we got to, I believe. Verse number 14. And let's look at it, please, if you would, now. And it said this. It said, uh, And it came to pass, when she came to him, that she moved him to ask of her father a field. And she lighted from off her ass. And Caleb said unto her, What wilt thou? And she said unto him, Give me a blessing, for thou hast given me a south land, Give me also springs of water. And Caleb gave her the upper springs and the nether springs. Now, the upper springs was a uh, uh, spring sort of like we have around here in this part of the country. A lot of places don't have it. Where you go up on top of a mountain, you've got a spring popping up up there. And the nether springs were the one down at the bottom. She said, just give me a piece of land where there's water. Years ago, when people went into a community, all you got to do is go to Marion, Spruce Pine, Burnsville, Linville, anywhere up there, and all them little houses are built along that river. And the poor people had to live up on top of the mountain. Nowadays, it's the other way around. The rich man lives on top of the mountain because we dig wells and got water up there. But years ago, uh, the poor man lived up on top and he couldn't even make a garden. There was so much rock and stuff, and people wanted that river bank. They wanted that river. They could have a garden. They could drink, feed their animals. Uh, the, the grass was nice. The weather was even better. And they wanted it. So that's the nether springs, the upper and the nether. You don't have to go to school to figure out what a word like nether means there in, in verse number 15. And the children, look at verse 16. I'm hurrying because we've got a lot to get to. Verse number 16. And the children of the Kenite, Moses' father-in-law, went up out of the city of palm trees the city of palm trees. And uh, that would be Jericho. According to Deuteronomy chapter 34 and verse 3, they called Jericho the city of the palm with the children of Judah into the wilderness of Judah and lieth in the south of Arad and they went and dwelt among the people. So what they did there, uh, uh, verse 17, those two cities there, were called uh, Horma, and and uh, the city. I, I showed you last week how that sometimes in the Bible it'll have Luz like L U Z, Horma, Kirjath Arba, a lot of those, and it'll say that city, and then over here somewhere it'll say another name for it, and you got these dumb scholars saying, "See, there's a contradiction in the Bible," and all it is is a different name for the same place. Lots of cities in the Bible have the same place, different names. Like Horma means utter destruction. Jericho, Luz, uh, Ramoth Gilead. It'd be like me saying L.A., one name. Los Angeles, another name. I said last week. City of Angels, another name. Hellhole, another name. All, all those are names for the same place. <laughs> Ain't that right? Uh, uh, Los Angeles. And all the... Uh, Charlotte. Somebody tell me. 
the Queen City, right? Well, if you was writing the book and said, uh, my daughter was born in Charlotte. And then all they're saying, we, we, our kids were born in the Queen City. Oh, there's a contradiction. No, it ain't. That's two different names for the same place. Make sure when you hear somebody say they found a contradiction in the Bible, the contradiction's in their brain. It ain't in the Bible. There's never been a contradiction found in this book. That was valid. And anytime somebody thinks they have found, the, the problem's with them. I, I, there's a place in the Bible where it said don't eat, certain kinds of meat, and then it said there you eat meat, eat, meat you want. That ain't a contradiction. It's Jesus died on a cross in between there and took that out of the way, nailing it to his cross. It's a dispensation when God deals us a certain way. No contradiction. None. If you meet anybody that says there's contradictions in the Bible, all you got to do is hand it to them. Show me one. And 99 out of 100 will say, well, I don't know where they're at, but they're in there. You know what they're at? They just heard somebody say that. And it sounded good, and they used it to get off the hook so they wouldn't have to uh, give an account to God. But I'm telling you, brother, there ain't no contradictions in this book. There's people, they'd have found it by now. Somebody would have found it by now. These people have been through it hundreds of times and hundreds and hundreds and never successfully proved a contradiction in the Bible. One fellow offered $10,000, something anybody could find contradiction in the Bible. They took it to court. Somebody took him to court two or three times, threw out every time, threw out of court. You cannot prove it. So uh, that's, that's with these names. Look at verse 17. And Judah went with Simeon, his brother, here we go now, watch this. And they slew the Canaanites that inhabited Zephath and utterly destroyed it. And the name of the city was called Hormah. Now, that name Hormah uh, means utter destruction. Also, verse 18, Judah took Gaza. Does that sound like anything you see on the news? Gaza, the Gaza Strip over there with the coast thereof and Ascalon with the coast thereof, and Ekron with the coast thereof. All those are old, I guess, old cities that are gone now, I'm, th I'm thinking. And the Lord was with Judah, and he drove out the inhabitants of the mountain, but could not drive out the inhabitants of the valley because they had chariots of iron. Now, look back at verse number 2. The Lord said unto Judah, uh, Judah shall go up, I have delivered the land into his hand. And there it said in verse 19, he could not drive out the inhabitants of the valley. So what that means is God would have gave it to him, but Judah doubted or failed somewhere. He didn't have no problem running them people off top of that mountain, but he got down that valley. That'll preach. He's the God of the mountain. He's the God of the valley. It's easy to trust God when you're up on the mountain. Amen. It's easy, boy, when everything's going right and your bills are paid, whoo, and you're healthy. But if you get down broke and lost your job, don't know where your next meal's coming from, your flesh hurting and everything else, you might sing a different song. He couldn't do it out of the valley. Now, God could have given it to him, but he just didn't, didn't have the faith evidently to do it because they had them chariots of iron. We're going to study iron one of these days. Iron is extremely important, study in the Bible. Iron, iron and clay, Clay represents people that Daniel's image, the toes mixed with iron and clay. Got a lot to do with the Antichrist, a Goliath sword, Goliath, the type of the Antichrist, and that iron. Iron Man that all the kids love to play with, the Iron Man video, the Iron Man, all that's a picture of the Antichrist coming. Now, let's look at verse 18, uh, 19. And the Lord was with Judah, and he drove them out, but not all, out of the valley. Verse 20. And they gave Hebron unto Caleb. There's old Caleb, same Caleb that said, Lord, I want that mountain. Eighty-three years old, brother. Amen. And he said, I want that mountain. And he expelled thence the three sons of Anak. That Anak guy was a uh, father of them giants. And old Caleb run three sons of theirs out of there. Verse 21. The children of Benjamin did not drive out the Jebusites that inhabited Jerusalem. But the Jebusites dwell with the children of Benjamin in Jerusalem unto this day. Now we'll stop on that verse for a minute. Verse 21. They did not 
drive them all out. They drove out some of them, but they didn't get them all. Partial obedience. I got sort of right, preacher. I quit drinking the real hard stuff, and now I just drink beer, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, he said, drive them out. Get them out. You ain't going to prosper until you get them out. And you, if you remember my message the other day on the, uh, the strangest story in the Bible, it was them Jebusites that caused all that trouble. And back here, the Bible said in verse 21, Benjamin didn't drive them out. And I'm telling you people, lo and behold, it started right here in verse 21 and winds up in chapter 19 uh, with 20-something thousand people losing their lives. You know why? Because Benjamin would not drive them out. Now, you know what that's a picture of? The Bible said them things were written for our example that we shouldn't fall and make the same mistakes they made. You know what that's an example of? You know what the Lord tells you to do? When you get right with God, He said, run them out, chase them out. Every little sin in our lives, in our heart, every bit of wickedness, every bit of worldliness, God said, kill them. As a matter of fact, the Bible puts it like this, mortify the deeds of the flesh. Kill them, kill them. You know what I'm supposed to do? Every single day, I'm supposed to go hunting them things that God said drive out of my life and drive them out, all of them. Not partially, not halfway, not three-fourths out. If they'd have drove them Jebusites out of town, that story over there in Judges 19 where the man cut up his concubine may have never happened. You see? A little sin left in your life. Just a little sin. You may think, well, I got rid of all them big ones. I'll keep that one little sin. That thing could grow and come back and get you one of these days. And here's, here's what we're studying on tonight. This part of Judges might be a little bit dull to you, but here's what it's teaching. It's teaching you kill that sin in your life or it'll kill you. You kill it or it'll kill you. We're in combat. You know that, right? We are in combat, people. This is war. We are in combat. I doubt seriously if you'll ever hear Joel Osteen get up and preach about how you're supposed to kill and mortify your members of this flesh. But that's because he leaves out any part of the Bible that may put pressure on people to do right or separate from the world. And the real preacher of the gospel will put the pressure on you to separate from sin and the world and drive that junk out of your life. Now, I don't know what your sin is tonight, but I'm telling you tonight, drive it out. I don't care if you've got to go to move in with your cousin in Montana for a month or go to rehab or quit your job. I know a girl, a uh, lady, years ago, she came to me and she said, Brother Danny, she said, Brother Danny, this man at work is really, really flirting with me. And I said, well, tell him to drop dead. And she said, no, I like it. And I said, you're getting in trouble. She said, well, we're just, we've just talked. We've not met. We've not. I said, you're getting in trouble. And she, she came back to me a few days later. She said, Brother Danny, he keeps saying things. He can, and I can feel myself start giving in. You know what I told her? Drive it out. Drive it out. You get sin in your heart like that, you better drive it out. If you don't kill it, it'll kill you. Amen? And you know what? She said, well, I can't. She said, I'm giving in. I said, quit your job. I said, are you serious? Yes. If quitting your job can save your marriage, quit your job. If quitting your job might save your testimony, quit your job. You say, well, that's a little extreme, and it? it's better than ruining your life like a lot of people are doing. And you know what she did? She quit her job, and I got her a job uh, at another place, and I, I talk, talked her up and got her a job, and that saved her marriage, saved her marriage. Me and her husband did have to go out riding around looking for her one night. I don't know if anything was going on or not. She said it wasn't, but uh, anyway, she made it, and they are in church tonight. You know why? She drove it out. She drove it out. I'm not letting this sin stay in me. I ain't letting it. If you've got lust in your heart, if you've got sin in your heart, 
You say, well, I just, I don't watch that old wicked pornography anymore, but I still watch from little, some R-rated movies, and it's got a lot of neg. You better drive it out. Drive it out. You, partial obedience won't do it. You say, well, I drove all them out. They left a little bit of it and wound up killing 22,000 of them. You better kill it. Or it'll kill you. You ain't smarter than everybody else. You ain't no better than nobody else. God, you ain't got no special deal worked out with God where it's all right for you to sin because you're single. You, don't, you ain't got no special deal worked out with the Lord because in your case, it's no. It, it ain't right in nobody's case. Listen, people, right's right and wrong's wrong. No matter who does it, me, you, your grandma, right's right and wrong is wrong. And if you don't drive the sin out of your life, it'll get you. It'll get you. You kill it, it'll get you. You find it out, or it'll find you out. I mean, it's war. It's war. Chase it down and kill it. You say, well, Brother Danny, I'm having stuff in my heart that I shouldn't have. What should I do? Get your Bible. Get your Bible and fast and pray and beg God to take that desire for that sin out of you. And pray, I mean, stay after God till it does, till he does it. Till he does it. I'm telling you. I'm telling you, it'll get you. Kill or be killed. Now, the liberals, the liberal uh, today and the Democrats and the people on the left, as we call it, and half of the backslid church people would say this. They'd say, oh, that is so cruel. He shouldn't go in there and kill those poor Jebusites. Well, would you rather kill a few hundred of them or 22,000 young people die? You know, it's just like this war with ISIS and everything, people. Listen, I, I don't believe, I don't want to have to kill nobody, and I hope and pray I never do have to. But in, in war, it's you kill them or they'll kill you. That's what war is. That's awful. We don't like to think about that, but that's what war is. We don't start wars. We don't, we're supposed to. Uh, we don't, we don't uh, go just pick on countries. We ain't supposed to. But if somebody comes in trying to kill us, you don't sit down and say, now listen, let's talk, and we can negotiate. Buddy, it's kill them before they kill you. That's, that's rough talk, but that's the way it is, and that's the way sin is. Mortify your members where it's upon the earth. Amen? Uh, a, a General Patton, uh, they said, put it like this. He, he said, um, they said, well, are, are you going to ask us to die for our country? I say, he said, no, I'm not asking you to die for your country. You make the other guy die for his country, the enemy, right? That's the right philosophy, amen? You don't want nobody to die, but if somebody's got to die for their country, let it be him die for his country and us stand for our country. You're a little squeamish. Some of y'all getting a little squeamish. You're a little bit milked up on this modern-day liberal nice Christianity that doesn't offend anybody. And if you're not careful, you'll get too soft. Listen, this book is a book of war. It's a book of war. I mean, two-thirds of the Bible is about is war after war. I don't like it, but that's just the way life is. Sometimes you've got to fight. And, brother, if you don't fight, this flesh will get you. It'll get you. It'll get you. It sure will. It will get you. Let's look at verse number. We're, we're going to move on. Uh, Luz is at uh, verse 22. The house of Joseph, they also went up against Bethel, and the Lord was with them. And the house of Joseph sent to descry Bethel. Descry. Anybody know what descry means? Spy out. That's it. To spy. You don't have to go changing the Bible. Oh, the Bible's hard to understand. We need to put that describe means of mine. You don't have to be a genius. If, matter of fact, if you read it, it pretty much tells you nine times out of ten, any word in the Bible that you can't understand, like let, I was trying to come to you, but I was let hitherto, old English. You ought to be able to figure that out. I was hindered. Something stopped me. And a simple dictionary can give you the definition of all those words. You don't have to rewrite the Bible and take God turn him into an it, neither he nor she. Uh, you don't have to do that. That's just an excuse to get to change it. So describe. Now the name of the city before was Luz. That would be Bethel. Jacob, Joseph uh, uh, called it, they called it Bethel because it meant back to God or the house of God. And then it was actually Luz 
Verse 24. And the spies saw a man come forth out of the city and said unto him, Show us, we pray thee, the entrance into the city, and we shall show thee mercy. And when he showed them the entrance of the city, they smote the city with the edge of the sword, but they let go the man and all his family. That's a picture of salvation, grace, stuff like that. And the man went into the land of the Hittites and built a city and called the name thereof Luz. There it is again, which is the name thereof unto this day. Now watch, here we go again with another tribe. Neither did Manasseh drive out the inhabitants of Beth Shean and her towns, nor Tanak, nor her towns, nor the inhabitants of Dor and her towns, nor the inhabitants of Iblim and her towns, nor the inhabitants of Megiddo. That word look familiar, Megiddo, Armageddon, Armageddon. It means uh, the hill of the, of the crowded, uh, Megiddo does, and all her towns. But the Canaanites would dwell in that land and it came to pass when Israel was strong that they put the Canaanites to tribute and did not utterly destroy them. Uh, they uh, had to pay taxes, just made them pay taxes. They didn't kill them and get them out. Verse 29, neither did Ephraim drive out the Canaanites that dwelt in Gezer. Look at verse 30. Neither did Zebulun drive out the inhabitants of Kitron. Look at verse 31. Neither did Asher drive out the inhabitants of Echo, but the Asherites dwelt. Verse 33. Neither did Naphtali drive out the inhabitants of Beth Shemesh, nor the inhabitants of Beth Anath, but he dwelt. Verse number 34. We'll stop there. And, and look at the bottom of verse 33. Made tributaries unto them. Now the reason I read all that spice was to show you tribe after tribe after tribe after tribe did not not obey God and run them all out. He said, get them out. If you don't, you'll follow their gods and you'll worship their gods and you'll catch their diseases and you'll poison you. Now, in our generation, translated, me and you have to keep the sin run out of our lives, daddies of our home. All you daddies in here, you're going to answer to God for your home and what you allowed in your home and what you did not allow in your home. You say, well, I can't have it. My wife don't. says she don't care. She's going to do what? Well, she'll answer to God for it. You stay right with God. You stay right with the Lord. If your husband's full of the devil, you stay right with the Lord. God will still bless you. But I'm telling you something, brother. If you don't run that sin out, it'll get you. The Bible said, be sure your sin will find you. Let's just say you have a habit of lying. Lying is an addictive sin. When you tell a lie, you'll be real careful or you'll tell another lie because that one was so easy. If you got a kid that lies, that's a hard thing to get out of. They figured out the way to get out of trouble is lie. But the problem is, it's coming down the road somewhere. Excuse me. The best thing to do is tell the truth. The best thing to do is tell the truth. You say, well, Brother Danny, I have a hard time not lying. Run it out. Get down on your knees, fast a whole day, and say, God, help me not to lie. Have you got a filthy habit that you sort of keep in your life? That's like neither did, the, the, uh, neither did Naphtali drive out the inhabitants. He let them stay in the land. Heard about this guy one time. He had this... Uh, he was worked for a circus or something. He had this big old snake. Had them some kind of snake, and he wrapped around his arm like that, you know, and everything. And he would stand out there and do a show like this, and everybody just go ooh and all. Oh my gosh, how can you stand that? No, ooh, I can't stand to see that snake wrapped around his arm like that. Oh, oh, ain't you scared of that? No, man, I do this all the time. And sure enough, sure enough, one day that thing got right around his neck, and it's its nature. That snake's nature, like a boa constrictor got around his neck, and they say, watch that man choke and gag, and it got him. It got him. That's what that sin in your life will do. That's what that sin in your life will do. It'll get you. You may think, ah, oh, God, I've been doing this for months. Look at here, it ain't going to hurt me. That's famous last word, buddy. Famous last words is, I got this under control. How many people died on overdose of drugs and thought, I can handle this? How many people become alcoholics because they think, I can just drink a little bit? I heard a guy this week I, I thought was a good, dedicated Christian man, and I heard him talking about uh, 
drinking a little, uh, some new place opened up here in Morgan, and, and they're talking about going there for a drink. So I thought, man, now if I say anything, I'm an overboard, crazy, fanatical, too, too right wing. Uh, I'm telling you, a little bit turns into a whole lot after a while. Every alcoholic in the world started with one drink. You can never be an alcoholic if you don't take one drink. It's liquid devil. Drugs the same way. Start up cigarettes, pot, next thing, next thing, next thing, next thing, next thing. It starts off little. If you don't get it out, first thing you know, it'll get you. Mortified. The Paul said mortify. What does that word sound like? Mortician? Dead? Every morning, I'm supposed to wake up and say, all right, you're dead. You don't have a right to do what you want to do. Shut up. You don't have a right to go where you want to go. You be careful, little hands, what you touch. Be careful, little feet, where you go. Be careful, little ears, what you say. I don't have the right to listen to music that I like. I don't have the right to go to the places that I like. Lord, some people like, like uh, crack, brother. Uh, it don't matter what you like or what you prefer. You, you are not your own. You are bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and spirit which are God's. I know, I know. Oh, you one of them, oh, just old, old, old Baptist that believe, preach separation, preach separation. It's for your own good. Father, you can stay away from this world, their filthy habits, the better off you'll be, buddy. You want a blessed life? You know what gives you diseases a lot of times? Fooling around with something you ain't got no business fooling around with. You know, they get mad at people for saying that AIDS is God's judgment, you know, on sin. And, but it is. It really is. They could have stopped it when it first started if everybody quit sinning. And it's not just homosexuals. It's heterosexuals. It's everybody that gets AIDS. It's not just a homosexual disease. But it was by and large in the homosexual community. So I'm going to tell you something. A lot of people would have been a healthy and alive today if they had chased that sin out of their life. Amen? That's what, the, that's what this chapter is teaching. Drive them out. Drive them out. Let's look at verse number 34. And the Amorites forced the children of Dan into the mountain, for they would not suffer them to come down the valley. Isn't that weird that it keeps mentioning that? Mountain and valley stuff. Uh, that's, that's strange. I, I hadn't been able to exactly get why, they're, why, why it keeps saying that, but evidently... What it's teaching us is it's easy to live for God on a mountain hard in the valley. And look at verse number um, 36. And the coast of the Amorites was from the going up unto Akrabim, Akrabim, Abracadabra, I don't know, uh, from the rock and upward. So that would be, that would be uh, scorpion. That word means scorpion. And that verse is saying... Uh, when uh, that word to run them out, the the best the best way I know how to describe this, these people didn't run them out. That tribe didn't run them out. Them didn't run them out. Them didn't run them out. And they said that where this all ended up was over in the book of Jeremiah when they burnt the whole cities, burn them, burnt Jer Jerusalem to the ground, destroyed it. That's where it winds up. Sin will eventually destroy you. All right. Let me, let me end by saying this. If any of us, and it could be any of us before it's over, was dying, it said, doctor told us we have cancer. Brother Derek's had cancer. Brother Wayne has had skin cancer. I don't know if anybody else in here has been, ever had a bout with cancer or not. Uh, but that's, that's one of the scariest words in the English language, cancer. When you go for your treatments, you go to that doctor, and he says they're done, what's the first thing you say? You say, did you get it all? Right? Did you get it all? Now, why can't we think like that when it comes to living for God? What if the doctor says, well, we got about 90% of it. That means you got 10% still left in me. It's going to grow and destroy me. I want it all, doctor. Every bit of it. No matter what I have to suffer, no matter how bad it hurts, no matter what I have to sacrifice, get this cancer out of me. Get that same attitude towards your sin. All of it, Lord. Every dirty movie, all dirty music, any dirty jokes, 
Don't look at nothing you're supposed to look at on your phone. Nothing. No pictures, no videos, every bit of it. Lord, get it all. You say, well, I don't want to get it. You want to leave a little cancer in there? Remember that little illustration the Lord gave me before I came tonight? Remember that. Anybody got a question or a comment? You know what you've learned in the first book, chapter of Judges? You've learned if you don't get rid of your sin, it will get rid of you. That's worth knowing. Anybody? Right quick.